Well, good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. And thank you, Catherine, for that very warm welcome. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you virtually from Ottawa on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabek people. And I'm pleased to join the you this morning for day three of the 2022 Toronto Global Forum. And I want to begin by thanking the International Economic Forum of the Americas and their team for their planning and um, this, uh, you know, putting together this really impactful conference. Over the past few days, you have all had the opportunity to hear from some impressive keynote speakers, uh, take part in learning sessions and make connections through network as we work towards strengthening our economy here in Canada and internationally. As a minister responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, one of my main goals is to help address the issues impacting the region and focus on creating good, sustainable jobs and driving clean, inclusive economic growth across Southern Ontario. Our region accounts for more than a third of Canada's overall GDP and employment and its economy has a major impact on prosperity across Canada. Southern Ontario is also the manufacturing heartland of Canada. It accounts for over 43% of the country's manufacturing output and employs more than 750,000 workers. Our prosperity has been built largely upon our manufacturing legacy and it remains poised to play a leadership role in advanced and green manufacturing. We are incredibly lucky that our auto sector is an anchor of manufacturing in Canada. Five of the world's largest original equipment manufacturers are located in the region. And there is access to world leading technologies across the globally renowned tech innovation corridor that spans from Kitchener-Waterloo to Toronto to Ottawa. That is just one of the reasons why we have seen more than $15 billion invested in electric vehicles and the battery manufacturing supply chain in Southern Ontario. We are also a leader in greening steel manufacturing. In fact, in my hometown of Hamilton, ArcelorMittal de Fasco is undertaking a $1.8 billion transformation project to electrify its furnaces by 2028. I can tell you they couldn't have chosen a better place to do that and to make this investment. And we knew that Hamilton was the right location for this first plant. Uh, I'm so proud as a lifelong Hamiltonian that this was the place that was chosen to show this innovation and leadership taking place in the region. And, you know, we often hear uh, ArcelorMittal de Fasco's slogan, our product is steel, our strength is people. And I think that they have that absolutely right. Believe me, and I know that other speakers have talked about this, the power in people, having the right people to make these investments. And uh, Hamilton is one, but a small example of that. In the food and beverage sector, some of our largest producers are undertaking large first in Canada and first in world investments to green their operations and drive future growth. Maple Leaf Foods in London spent close to three quarters of a billion dollars to build one of the most technologically advanced poultry processing plants in the world, while also reducing its carbon footprint by over 50%. You might be asking what is driving all of this momentum in manufacturing across southern Ontario and why am I so optimistic? As I mentioned, it's the overlap between the tech and manufacturing sectors. But also, as I have mentioned, it is the people. We have the talent and we have hardworking people here. It is all levels of government coming together to collaborate and create the conditions that encourage such large scale investment across key sectors. It is the strength of growing talent in our region. Our universities and colleges are doing just that. And I know that very well. I'm fortunate to have three post-secondary educational institutions in my riding. And I, I witness firsthand the amazing work that they are doing. They are producing a highly skilled and diverse workforce and a steady supply of world-leading researchers that are ready to meet the demand and create uh, created by these investments. Our strategic location and interconnected transportation networks are also a significant advantage.
In fact, the port of Hamilton is the largest port in Ontario and has easy access to the transcontinental rail lines and the highway network into the northeastern United States. And finally, let me say this. I am very excited about this amazing portfolio that the Prime Minister has asked me to serve. It's about elevating people. And I know the role of the federal uh, of FedDev Ontario is to work with partners and stakeholders to harness the potential of the region and to translate the incredible work that is already taking place across this region into economic success. We do this by making strategic investments through programs that stimulate economic growth and innovation and help businesses grow. And I would like to take this opportunity during Small Business Week to give a special shout out to all our small business entrepreneurs who are doing incredible work across the region and across the country. As we continue to recover from COVID-19, we know it's important to connect and continue the dialogue on national and global issues that impact our economy. This is essential to our success. We can learn from one another and chart our way forward. I want to thank you all for the work that you are doing. It is so important for the Canadian economy. And I hope that you all enjoy the rest of today's session. Thank you very much. Merci. Hello, I'm Jim Bradley, Chair of the Niagara Region. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce this morning's plenary session. The Niagara Region and our team at Niagara Economic Development are pleased to be strategic partners for this year's Toronto Global Forum. Niagara is a critical hub for trade between Canada and the United States and is one of North America's most important economic trade corridors. We are perfectly positioned for companies looking to access domestic and international markets. The trade that flows across Niagara's borders totals well over $100 billion and supports hundreds of thousands of jobs across Canada and the United States. The infrastructure network that supports this important trade activity includes five international bridges, multiple railways, pipelines, and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway system, linking Niagara to the Atlantic Ocean and beyond. This morning, you'll be discussing the significant impact that marine transport can have on the future of manufacturing, both locally and globally. In Niagara, we are fortunate to have the Welland Canal, which has helped shape our past and continues to play a significant role in the current and future economic success of our region. The Welland Canal connects Lake Ontario to Lake Erie and carries 78% of all freight that makes its way through the St. Lawrence Seaway, which connects the Atlantic Ocean to inland ports in Ontario, Quebec, and the Midwest United States. In addition to connecting Niagara's businesses to ports throughout the Great Lakes and the Atlantic Ocean, the Welland Canal supports the activities of over 50 businesses, more than 2,400 jobs, and hundreds of millions of dollars in business revenue in Niagara each year. And with last year's launch of the Hamilton Oshawa Port Authority's Niagara Ports Multimodal Hub in Thorold, along with several recent contract successes at Heddle Shipyards Port Weller Dry Docks, the marine industry is helping to bring new jobs and investments to our region. Locally, we are seeing a renewed sense of optimism and momentum in Niagara's marine transportation sector. And all levels of government, along with our private and sector partners, must commit to working together to help ensure this momentum continues. That is why late last year, the Niagara region joined with the City of St. Catharines in calling on the Ontario government to create a comprehensive marine strategy for the province to help guide future investments in modern and competitive infrastructure for marine communities. Growing a substantial blue economy is an important component to Niagara's economic future, and I would anticipate that other coastal communities would have the same appreciation for their marine transportation sector as we do in Niagara. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. And Catherine, thank you very much. It is so good to see a Westerner doing so well in central Canada. And Catherine, remember, you're always welcome back at home. Well, let's take an opportunity, this opportunity this morning, to have a conversation about a pretty big topic. You will see, and welcome, Member of Parliament, I see you up there, and I wish you were here on the stage, but I understand you've got voting responsibilities today, so the whip wouldn't let you go. 
So that's fine. Look, I wanted to just set the stage quickly because it is a very big topic and we need to have an understanding as where we want to get in the next 30 minutes or so. I think we can all agree that the world is experiencing an extraordinary and I would suggest jarring transition resulting in what many are referring to the dawn of the new industrial revolution, which brings us to our conversation today. As a senator, I had the privilege of serving in the Senate of Canada for close to 10 years, serving as the chair of the Banking, Trade and Commerce Committee and the vice chairman of the Energy and Environment Committee. I had the opportunity to see up close, in a small way, what this transition was looking like and what both the opportunities for Canada were and what the challenges are. So the causes for this transition, I think, are well known, but let's just lay it down this morning. The there has been a breakdown in supply chains globally and a breakdown in trading alliances. And as the former ambassador, Dominic Barton, to whom Canadians owe a great debt of gratitude, indicated the energy transition is affecting all of us. So you combine a breakdown in supply chains with an energy transition and the geo political challenges that we are facing, it is quite natural to see that there is going to be, throughout all sectors, a, uh, a dislocation and a need for a re-engagement in what we're styling as the Industrial Revolution. Ever so quickly, why have the supply chains broken down and why are trading alliances fractured? I think the, the, the simple answer for that is that the Western world believed for economic reasons that we should develop our supply chains globally because there was both economic reasons, it was cost less because labor costs less outside of uh, North America, outside of Western Europe, but also we thought there was a political advantage. The political advantage was that we will export democracy and by doing so our values will become the values of the broader world. Well, guess what? It didn't work. And it didn't work for a number of reasons, principally because of the rise of the, what is referred to as ESG, Environment, Social and Governance, uh, requirements which are affecting all companies and now their suppliers. So trust, distrust was built into the system, whether it was on child labor, whether it was on not meeting environmental standards. And we saw this distrust most recently, or I saw it most recently, on the vaccine COVID challenges in Canada. Canada should have been a leader in developing vaccines. We were not because we had partnered with the Chinese and our Halifax, uh, Halifax investment opportunities and the product that was required from China never arrived. So we were set back. We also saw it with masks as well. Energy, of course, which I'm very familiar being an elected senator, former elected senator from Alberta, our goal towards net zero, which is key, is disruptive. Our move to renewables is disruptive. And we just simply look around the world now and we see that energy supply, security, weaponization of energy has completely upset the equation. Therefore, back at home, we have to figure out how is it that we take advantage of these opportunities that are presented and manage the challenges. So let's drill down. Let's take as an example the Niagara region and let's take as an example the industry of shipping and all related to ships. And we'll use that as our petri dish this morning to examine how some of the leaders in that space, two of them are here, and we have the member on the uh, screen this morning, how they are dealing with the challenges of meeting the uh, industrial challenges that are facing them. So to unpack this, to help unpack this, we have two great representatives this morning. We have Chris Wright, Exhibit A, who is the CEO of Canal Marine and Industrial. We have Sean Padula, who is the president and CEO of Heddle Shipyards. And on screen, we have Vince Badaway, the member of parliament and a long serving public servant, not only in Ottawa in the House of Commons, but in a municipal government and whatnot in his region of Niagara. So gentlemen, thank you very much for being available with that introduction. Let's dig in if we can. So what I'd like to start with, if I may, and, and um, 
We'll start just with you two folks. The first question is for you two, and then we're going to move on the second question to you. Um, so can you tell me from your experience the impacts of this transition is having, this industrial revolution transition, how is it affecting your businesses, if at all? So Chris, why don't you kick it off? Sure. Um, well, I think uh, if you'd asked me maybe 10 years ago, I, I might have disagreed with the premise um, that we're in a new industrial revolution because it, it, it probably never felt that way. Uh, it felt, it, especially in the shipping industry, we're very much in the era of oil and gas. But it, in recent years, uh, things have changed uh, quite a lot. And uh, we're now looking at companies wanting to um, use more efficient and environmentally friendly power and propulsion systems. Uh, that's been great for my company because that's, kind of, that's what we do. We're, we're, we're uh, on the ele electrical side of things and we, we electrify power and propulsion in shipping. So, and, and recently, you know, a good example of this is the, uh, the Marilyn Bell uh, zero emission ferry at Toronto Island Airport, which, which some of you may have experienced, um, completely zero emission. It's a battery powered vessel. Um, and, and that really shows the way the industry is going. And there's a lot of interest in, uh, in, in making things greener. So uh, after possibly a slow start, uh, the shipping industry is, uh, is very much taking this on board and, and we're seeing the fruits of that now. Great, how about you, Sean? What do you see? First of all, Senator, thank you so much for, uh, for having me here today. And Vance, it's great to see you. And Chris, it's great to be on stage with you. We are, without a doubt, seeing a, an incredible transition right now to what I'm calling a shipyard 4.0 state in terms of the next phase of the Industrial Revolution for at least our industry. And, and what that means is the way in which we are doing work or will do work in the future is changing radically um, and it's, it's almost month to month at this point. And so because of, you know, geopolitical micro and, and macro events that are occurring all over the world, there's a number of reasons that we're changing out of necessity, mm -hmm. but there's also a number of reasons that we're changing because it's, it's a better way of working. And Chris touched upon some of the things that are happening with zero emissions and, and propulsion systems. But in the shipyard, we're also looking at the way we're doing work to improve efficiencies, to try and compete with other jurisdictions around the world that I would say have competitive advantages against us. Mm -hmm. And so for the first time at our shipyard in Niagara, for example, in Port Weller, it's a beautiful shipyard in the middle of wine country. So you can imagine the juxtaposition where you have welders and torches and slag flying around. We're transitioning into robotics right now for the first time. And it's not necessarily to replace any of the employees that we have, but it's to augment them. And so all the welders that we currently have are gonna be receiving training on how to use robotics. We're using 3D scanners to essentially build digital twins of ships that we're repairing or ships that we're going to build. Um, and we've started introducing virtual reality for training. And, and these are all things that I think are a necessity in terms of moving to the next phase of you know, at least advanced manufacturing within the shipyard space. So it's exciting times for us. Interesting. I want to ask about the challenges. We're going to come to you two folks in a moment, but tell me from where you sit representing the region, seeing the changes that are being uh, affecting businesses in your region, people in your region, what are the opportunities and the challenges as you see them from where you sit, sir? Well, the challenges have in the past, especially as it relates to the many jobs for the manufacturing sector that were lost. Uh, over 6,000 of my writing literally over eight. Um, I guess the, stra the strategy and the advantages that we have and the strengths that we have is transportation. Uh, we have been very diligently working with our American partners to ensure that we bring closer our, our markets to more domestic in nature as two countries. Are people hearing now? Two separate microphones. Are you hearing me all right? No, we can't. So what we're going to do is, and, and we want to hear every word. That's the starting point. So what we need to do is if the folks here in the room can deal with the audio and we'll turn to our folks here on the stage while that gets fixed, okay? Fair enough. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So let's focus on what are the challenges that uh, in your industries you are facing, whether the regulatory, taxation, you mentioned competition. I mean, what challenges the ability for your businesses to become world leaders? Um, the, in terms of regulation, I, uh, I, we're actually doing quite well in, in terms of exporting our, our product and uh, our services. 
Um, we're doing several projects in the US. A couple of years ago, we did hybrid vessels in, in the Cleveland area. Uh, right now, we're working on a zero emission ferry in Washington state. Um, so we've, we've done okay in, in dealing with uh, um, uh, any issues of uh, uh, regulation and, and protectionism. Um, I, I think as long as it's equitable, that, that's one important thing. Uh, there, there are some regulations that exist in the US that probably don't have a mirror in Canada, uh, for example, the Jones Act, and Sean can maybe talk about that a bit more. It, it affects shipbuilding. Um, but, but in general, right now, we're, we find we're able to compete uh, uh, fairly well. Um, we are worried about the global situation, Europe and uh, uh, the Far East, uh, areas where we, we do a small amount of work, uh, but we'd certainly like to expand that. Sean, what are the challenges that you see? The shipbuilding industry is not for the faint of heart, but I would say that there's one overarching challenge that we need to solve because within the next five years, we're predicting that we are going to need at least 800 more people in Port Weller, in Niagara. People. 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 Yeah. And so yeah. people yeah. is the number one challenge that we face right now. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing about that? I'm glad you asked. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I, <laughs> you know, it's an incredibly complex question because of all of the variables that we can see and that we can't see. But in short, what we're trying to do is attract people from other parts of the country to come to Ontario, but also upskill and reskill workers that are in the region. So Niagara was hit very hard during the COVID-19 pandemic because a lot of the, the industries that are in Niagara are geared toward hospitality and entertainment. And so there's an incredible number of people that I think can transition over to this advanced manufacturing that we're bringing back to the region and really get into shipbuilding. It's a new generation. One of the issues in Port Weller was that the shipyard was closed down for many years. And so we've essentially started a startup, which is great. There's pros and there's cons. But if you can imagine, you know, the shipyard, I'll call it 1.0, was, you know, steam driven machines and a lot of old and antiquated equipment. That's all gone. And it's given us a blank slate. And so I think attracting the next generation of, of a workforce in Niagara is going to be something that's very exciting for us, but also daunting. Does immigration play a role? A hundred percent. And how is that going? It's, it's at the moment, um, again, because of the pandemic, there's challenges. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I'm most proud of at Heddle is that we've actually adopted four families from individuals that originated from the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And it's but been an incredible success story. Okay. And my hope is that we can grow that from 10 to 20 to 30 families within the next year, because I think that, you know, this country was built on, on immigrants. Mm -hmm. My grandparents were immigrants. Mm -hmm. Well, look, just look around. There we have it. Right. <laughs> and so I think that we're at a point right now where we need immigration to help sustain the growth of this country. And you're finding that that's working, that your, your interface with the officials is getting done or does not more need to be done? There's always challenges, and I think that the system has been overwhelmed for a number of different reasons. Um, I think everybody's working hard and swimming in the right direction to get it done, and I'm confident that the issues that we're seeing as a result of backlogs that have happened over the last few years are going to be resolved in the not too distant future. Okay, very interesting. Well, let's try again. Let's, let's see whether the audio has been uh, fixed here. Very interested in your point of view as to the challenges and the opportunities that exist around manufacturing in your region. Can you hear me now? Let's go, let's try. <laughs> can you hear me? We can hear you. Sir. Okay, perfect. Well, folks, again, uh, thank you for having me on, on today. And I have to say that uh, although we've had many challenges in the past, uh, many jobs lost for the manufacturing sector throughout the region, literally happening overnight between 2010 and 2015, we're really moving forward with strategies. And I'll say Niagara's new energized economy that takes full advantage of our region's strengths are front and center. Uh, Jim introduced in his opening comments, Chair Bradley introduced the Niagara Port Small to Model Trade Corridor, which in fact includes both the robust supply chain as well as workforce, as we mentioned earlier. But I'll say this to the uh, watching it, it's not without a lot of effort. And, and the strengths that we're, we're actually recognizing today are with our stakeholders. Galleries working with business, working with labor groups uh, at all levels of government, and it's starting to work. So those strengths, of course, being our, our location, our one day's drive of, of overall North American income, 
when you look at uh, when you look at uh, lands that are available, including those that are serviced, uh, as well as many other attributes that we have throughout the region, the incentive packages, including the gateway incentives, the foreign trade zone, uh, our work-life balance in the region, uh, the support for industry and supply chain, workforce, strong strategic partnerships between. Uh, the, in this case, the federal government, the local governments, the private sector, labor, and a lot of the NGOs, again, is very robust. But I want to say this. From, from our end here up in Ottawa, the ratification of the four trade agreements over the past uh, six, seven years has established Canada as a major player in global trade. Uh, our although it's a small country, 38 million people, our economic population is over 1.8 billion the B people. However, capacities have to be strengthened. And when we talk about our sector in a, in a multimodal fashion, road, rail, air, water, it's critical that we binationally work together, integrating both our logistics and distribution systems, taking full advantage of our supply chains in individual regions like Niagara, taking full advantage of our workforce and our NGOs. And that's in fact what we're doing. It was introduced earlier about the Hamilton Oshawa Port Authority Agreement taking in the advantages and the strengths between Lake to Lake, St. Catharines right down Lake Ontario, right down to Auburn, Lake Erie. And that's creating a lot of new opportunities, economic opportunities along lands that stayed in for many years that are now developing. Case in point, the city of Toronto. Two pulp and paper mills empty for the past five years, now full with economic activity. The, the Cleary Dock, full with economic activity. The former Hayes Dam, now just looking at re-energizing itself to be once again full activity. And that's moving right down the well and down corridor. So the bottom line here is that two of them. One, we work together binationally to integrate our markets, to have instead of two domestic markets, one domestic market, so that therefore our international trade performance is strengthened, as well as taking advantage, secondly, of the regional benefits that we can add to that overall macro uh, ability to again, strengthen the economic trade performance. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. I want to jump off on some comments that you have made and also a comment that Chairman Bradley had made earlier in the session. I am very interested in talking with you about a marine strategy. And I'm interested in your views of A, the marine, what a marine strategy would look like for Ontario, but I'm also very interested in how linkages can be established with other transportation networks across the country. I think particularly the West, surprise, because one of our great challenges in the West is getting product to market. So anything that can be done in this country to facilitate transportation, and you guys are in the business, seems to be something that could advantage the country. So talk if you can, about what does a marine strategy look like? Is it something you support? Is it something that should be, somebody should own? What do you think? Chris, do you want to kick it off? Yep. Um, looking at shipping in general, um, it, it often gets talked about as a, as a major producer of carbon, but if you, uh, if you look at it in terms of the, the amount of emissions per unit of, of cargo or, or people uh, transported, um, it's a very different story. It's it's a very efficient and uh, uh, method that should be encouraged of, of shipping goods. Um, regarding a, a, a marine strategy, um, I, I think I'd, I, you know obviously the, the the industry should be supported. Um, one interesting thing is that uh, around the Great Lakes area there aren't many passenger services, um, so I think that's definitely an area that could be exploited. Um, in fact, I, I could, apart from tourism, cruise uh, services, uh, actually getting people from A to B, um, I can't think of too many examples. Um, so I think there's opportunities there, actually, especially as driving uh, becomes less and less pleasant. Um, mm -hmm. So I think any strategy could, could take these things into account. Uh, it should be, uh, you know, encourage mar the marine avenues as a means of uh, transportation and, uh, and, and moving goods around. Okay, great. What do you think about that, Sean? And what does it look like? What does a corridor look like? Of course. So Vance was in the shipyard not too long ago and we had a long conversation about this marine strategy. So I think it's been a long time coming. 
Right now, the federal government is engaged in the National Shipbuilding Strategy, which is a procurement, the largest procurement in the history of Canada, over $100 billion, to rebuild the fleets for the Royal Canadian Navy and the Canadian Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. They've recognized that marine is important, and the province has followed suit. And so I've seen some pretty incredible things done by the federal government and the province recently in terms of child care, electric vehicles. And I really think that a marine strategy is the next thing that the province and the feds can do together uh, in order to bring a ton of economic activity, not only to Ontario, but to help Canada build ships that it needs that are vital for protecting the country, but also protecting our economy. And so, you know, Vance can, can wrap off these numbers far better than I can, but if you look at the Welland Canal, the corridor, you have over $10 billion worth of economic activity generated over each year. And so when you think of a marine strategy, I think there's three pillars. There's the ports, which essentially act as economic hubs on the shore, but also linkages for the water corridors. There's the operators. So those are the companies that are transiting all the cargo that's important to Canadian trade across the waterways, whether it be wheat from the West, which is incredibly important, especially now, given all the economic uncertainty that's happening in the Ukraine and, and getting wheat out of the Ukraine. Um, you have aggregate and, you know, if you look at Thunder Bay, for example, and some of the lithium mines that are up there and we look at electric vehicles, all of that cargo is going to be moved across the waterways, which is incredibly important. And then the third pillar, I would say, is the industries that support the operators, shipyards. So places where ships are built or they're repaired or companies like Canal that are actually working on the propulsion systems or the entire electrical systems on board these ships. It's an incredible amount of economic activity. And so when you think of a marine strategy, how do you promote those three pillars in those businesses? I think it's a holistic approach whereby you incentivize businesses in that space like other jurisdictions have done. So Quebec's a great model. Quebec is fantastic at promoting industry internally and they've done a great job and they're building lots of ships in Quebec. And I think what they've done is, is they've looked at incentives for R&D, but also incentives for training people because again, this was an industry that had fallen off for many years in Canada, and we've now realized that it's strategically important. And if you look at the ports, I think also providing tech and R&D to our ports so they become competitively, competitive globally. I, I spent five years in Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. A ship would unload there, and hardly any people would be there to unload the ship. It was all automated, and it would be done quickly and efficiently. As you start delivering larger volumes of cargo, the turnaround times for those vessels is extremely important so that at the end of the day, the consumer is not paying for the additional unloading or loading fees. And so I, I think the ports are extremely important. And then the operators, you know, incentivizing them to be able to operate efficiently in this country is extremely important. Otherwise, you're going to see them start offshoring a lot of different things, whether it's the building of vessels offshore or the actually holdings of their companies offshore. And so we need to make this a competitive jurisdiction for all three of those pillars to operate within our space in Canada. And is that happening? It is. I, I'm, I'm pleased to say this. And again, I think this is a, you know, an incredibly bipartisan issue. Minister Mulroney has been incredible in terms of the outreach that she's had with our company in developing marine strategy specific to the shipbuilding, ship repair space. And I'm sure Chris can say that she's done the same with a lot of the marine industry providers and suppliers in Ontario. And so what they're doing right now is engaging businesses. And I would say that within the next year or two, Ontario is going to have a comprehensive marine strategy. Oh, that's interesting. And what role does the, does the federal government have in a marine strategy? What is your view on that? Well, a few things. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this as a preface to my comments, that we have to be all, regardless of what level of government we're in, that this is a good government, not the business of politics. So we've got to park political side of it and just get down to business and dealing with the strengths that we have here in Canada. Having said that, we've taken a layered approach. Here at the federal government, we've taken on an approach that looks at all aspects of moving trade. Our Ports Modernization Review, our St. Lawrence Sphere Review, the establishment of a uh, transportation logistics strategy. And this all comes from the Emerson Report released in 2015, which is a review of the Canadian Transportation Agency. So we're there. Uh, now we have to bring the province on board. Uh, we have been working for quite some time uh, to establish an Ontario marine strategy, like they have in Quebec and other parts of Canada. And as Sean said, uh, a lot of credit has to be given to the uh, provincial government for now keeping that front of mind. Uh, so now it's critical that they bring it past that point, put it into action. 
and it went online with our uh, efforts here up, uh, up in Ottawa. And then therefore we'll have a formalized strategy that takes into consideration people like Sean and making sure that Adam Marine and all businesses relative to transportation, not just Marine, but all transportation, are able to access the resources that are available at all levels of government. So the takeaway from that is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you would represent that the government of Canada is of the view that a marine strategy, a national marine strategy, is something that should be done. Is that accurate? Well, I, I, think, I think for clarification, a national transportation strategy that includes provincially established marine strategies and other. Yeah. Uh, what we're trying to do is ensure from a, from a, from a macro level that we take into consideration a very robust multimodal network uh, especially out in the west end of the country where rail is very predominant in prairies, but needs to be integrated and connected to, to, to marine, for example, in the Asia Pacific and Vancouver, but also through lakes into the eastern part of the country and into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, air and road are a big part of that as well. So what we've tried to do is, is establish that transportation and logistics strategy, which by the way includes not just what goes on the road, water, air, rail, but also within the system itself, integrating distribution logistics systems Binationally, but internationally, once again, we strengthen our overall global trade performance. Okay. But however, looking into those, the overall transportation strategy, yes, absolutely, it will definitely include a marine aspect, a marine related strategy. But let's be clear here these strategies, as they were in Quebec and other parts of Canada, must be established at the provincial level, including all the stakeholders, including the federal government, but must include uh, stakeholders in the individual regions, like Niagara. But again, establish at the provincial level. Very helpful and, and very wise, actually. You can't in this country advance, we're seeing that, if the federal government and the provincial governments don't work together. And Absolutely. We, certainly a, your call there is a very important one. Now, I want to talk, arising from that, and an earlier point that was made here, about where we are competitively in your industry now. Do we run the risk if we don't act prudently and promptly on the various matters that you've identified of losing businesses to, I don't know, Rotterdam, Sydney, Buenos Aires, Singapore? Or are we in a position that possibly we can build the businesses like you have and attract other businesses in your space? Where are we on that fulcrum? Mm -hmm. Well, um I think in terms of our specific industry, um, Canada is actually an engineering powerhouse. So you know, we have very good universities here. We produce great engineers in, in my field, electrical engineers. Um, and, and it's a recognized profession in Canada as well. Professional engineering is, is a licensed uh, profession, which um, you know you don't get in every part of the world. Um, so I think we have a pretty good foundation uh, and we're, we're highly respected. Um, we've had no real problem so far in terms of attracting customers from other parts of the world. Um, but we need to, to keep up with that. And we talked a bit about the, the problem of recruiting people and, and finding a uh, uh, workforce. Um, we, we need to keep on top of that, uh, especially I think with new technology, it's, it's, it has a little tendency to diversify a little bit. So um, you can't find somebody to just walk through the door who happens to, to already know right. about what you're doing. Um, so it's far more important to train. Uh, and what we're doing at Canal is getting involved with universities nice and early, so we'll take co-op students in, um, hopefully infuse them and train them, and uh, maybe they'll come and join us later or, or, or contribute to somebody else's efforts. Um, so training, I think, is going to be increasingly important um, as, as this diversification occurs. Um, so government help, I, I think, is, is also important there in terms of helping us to... Uh, to attract uh, a business uh, from other parts of the world and making the making the environment suitable for us to do that. What do you think, Sean? So I think the opportunity right now is incredible for the region and for our industry. I don't think it's a question so much of if we're going to lose it, because right now we're bringing it back. And one of the things I love about Vance is, you know, he is probably one of the biggest advocates for businesses in the Niagara region. And I mean, you heard him earlier talking about an Ontario marine strategy and, and him throwing his support behind that, even though it was at a different level of government and it's a different government in power in Ontario. But, but right now, the truth is, 
there is this incredible opportunity because the federal government has decided that shipbuilding and transportation and shipping is important. They've injected a in tremendous amount of capital into the space. And so, like I said to you, when we took over the Port Weller dry docks, it would have been in about 2017, there were zero employees. That facility had shuttered. We're at about 150 now. And based on the work and the backlog that's there with the federal government to build ships for Canada, we're going to need 800 people within the next five years. Right. And so it's a tremendous opportunity for the region. Okay. And you, f you feel that the planks that need to be in put in place for you to achieve those goals are being put in place? A, being recognized and B, being put in place? Domestically, yes. When we talk about competition, which was the second part of your question, I think other jurisdictions around the world, whether they be other countries, the um, so United States is a great example, uh, countries that are in Europe or countries that are in Asia, there has been an awareness about the importance of marine for a long time. And so if we look at China, where a lot of commercial vessels are being built by Canadian operators, most of those shipyards are owned by the state. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so it's incredibly hard to compete. And so I think that Canada is stepping up by injecting capital and building ships domestically at home. And, and we may have to look at, as geopolitical circumstances dictate, you know, additional measures. Um, but I'll leave that to the smarter people in the room and, and the people in Ottawa to figure out. Right, okay. And you, you talked about friendshoring, and of course a, a ship is a, a long lead time item. So from, from deciding you want to build the ship to delivery, it could be five or six years easily. So it's all the more important that uh, political risk is, is minimized, because the situation worldwide can change quite a lot, the political situation in, in five or six years. Very good flag you've raised there, absolutely. Do you find that the barriers to intra-provincial trade in Canada. Does that affect you at all? The ability to source product that you need to go into your ships or your repair operations. Do you find it sometimes easier to access product from Ohio than from, say, British Columbia? Um, I'm gonna... If you don't, you don't. I just, I see this in other industries that there's very real uh, walls Right, that we, on provinces. we are struggling right now. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a kind of intra-provincial uh, problem. I think it's actually a worldwide problem, but we, we, we cannot get advanced engineered products. Um, anything with a, a kind of high-spec microprocessor, which is a, something we, we need. We believe you. Um, yeah, <laughs> so even getting a car, I believe, is, <laughs> is, is difficult right now. So uh, um, get, getting, you know, motor drives and automation equipment and anything with, uh, with electronics, advanced okay. digital electronics. Okay. But I think it's a worldwide issue. I think all our competitors have the same problem. But we, we have pushed projects back a year for that reason, that okay. we, we just can't build the stuff this summer or we weren't able to build the stuff this summer to, to install during the winter while the, while the, the Great Lakes are largely shut Great. down. Great. Well, listen, as we move to wrap up, where I would like to end this is I'd like you to share with the audience and those who are watching, what is the ideal end state for you and your business? If you were the boss of the world, and uh, I'm also going to ask our friend on screen as well, if you were the boss of the world, what would your end state look like for your business and your region? Well... I think uh, for us, the ability to compete internationally is, is very important. Um, so many of our projects right now are in the States. Uh, we have a little bit in Europe. Um, but we, we are good at what we do, and I see a lot of other Canadian companies that have that advanced engineering capability um, and are very highly respected around the world. So given, given level playing fields uh, in our industry, uh, I think we'll do, we'll do very well. So it's the, it's the level playing fields that we're, we're seeking. And do you feel the, le the playing field is level? Um, I, I think there's some work that could be done just in kind of equalization. Um, I, I, uh, certainly, I... Uh, we can leave it there. Work, it, work to be done. A marine strategy possibly is necessary. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got to work with... <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sean, what do you think? Very well said. I think for our region specifically, if we're talking about Niagara and, and our business there, the Welland Canal and the St. Lawrence Seaway is completely underutilized. 
And so one of the issues that at least my business has faced over the years is, you look at Rotterdam, for example, there's probably more ships that travel into the port of Rotterdam on a weekly basis than traverse the St. Lawrence Seaway in a year. And so if we, as a country, and actually with our partners down in the south, realize the capacity of the seaway and realize the importance of the Welland Canal and increase transportation to do things like alleviate traffic on our highways, mm -hmm. but also to increase the trade volumes coming out of Canada, I think it will, it will drive more ships naturally within the space. And so that will benefit a lot of the, the companies like mine and Chris's in the region. And then secondary to that, you know, Canada is a seafaring nation. We are bordered by two oceans, third in the Arctic, if you think about it. And if you think about this, the Great Lakes, I mean, it, for all intents and purposes, the economic generator that it is, is an ocean as well. And so with Canada taking a very real look at the strategic importance of the water, I'd like to see ships being built in Ontario again in a very meaningful way. And the end game is ultimately to start exporting those ships. I think once we hit the ground running, being able to build vessels in Canada and export them to other countries around the world um, is a very real possibility. That is an exciting possibility. Um, sir, what do you think? If you, if you were the prime minister, maybe you'll be the prime minister one day, but if you were the prime minister, what would you do to ensure that the ideal state that you see comes to pass? Well, I think what's critical now is to continue what we're doing, working with uh, all levels of government uh, both on both sides of the border, uh, as well as uh, as well as the private sector, the labor groups, and, and all partners with the NGOs. But I, and Sean's comments were a perfect segue into mine, and that's boils down to one: that's capacity. There's no question what agreement that we have in place, uh, Niagara specific, our location, our infrastructure, uh, transportation infrastructure, the canal, the roads. Uh, a rail, air. again, we're within one day's drive of over 44% of North America's annual income. When you take all that into consideration, the capacity that we have to come in is growing and will continue to grow. However, the capacity to accept that growth run a challenge right now, vis-a-vis -vis infrastructure. We have to ensure that we learn Seaway uh, and, and it, all the areas along the lakes are up to date. Uh, so, therefore, it's incumbent upon, for example, the partners like the Steel Learn CUA, like the Hamilton Ontario Port Authority, and others to ensure that that transportation infrastructure, including road, rail, and air, is able to, uh, to deal with the, the future capacity that will go over time. Secondly, and equally as important, is that as we're making those capital infrastructure investments, that they're not made in isolation here in Canada, that they're in fact integrated with the capital investments the U.S. is making. We all share the Great Lakes. We all share rail lines, NCP in particular, air as well as roadways. So we have to make sure that there's no walls uh, built in between transportation and trade corridors, that more so they're opened up, including borders, by the way, that in fact create more fluidity for trade, not only between the two countries, but also, and this is my final point, also internationally. And, and my final point being that we have to further integrate uh, our economic policies, our economic efforts, both financially, both in the United States, therefore position ourselves as an economic, I'll use the word, partners, internationally. And just to take a second to reflect on how we were performing, uh, not just Canada, 38 million people, 1.8 billion people economically with their trade agreements aligned closer with the American markets, American trade as one. Uh, when we then go on the, the international market, uh, we're a lot more competitive. Places like Hedemann and others, Niagara and other places in the country are, are better able to perform based on integration of economic policies. Well, Mr. Badaway, thank you very much for those comments and thank you very much for your leadership on these issues. As I hear, it's going to be more important going forward to ensure that the challenges you've identified are met. So thanks very much and thank you for your ongoing service. And listen, Chris and Sean, to you, thank you very much for what you're doing, not only you know, in your communities, but more broadly for Canada. I mean, I've been very, very interested in this conversation because as a Westerner, as someone who's involved in public life in this country, transportation is a bottleneck 
for so much that gets done in this country, whether it's oil or gas or potash or people or canola and anything that can be done in this country to grease those wheels, and it sounds like there's something can be done here, Let's see what we can do. So as you move forward, and, and sir, as you move forward in developing these marine strategies, think about the role that the West can play in all of this because we have the products that need to get to markets and we're having difficulty uh, on, uh, completely around, around the loop on all kinds of products. So I think this is possibly could be a nation-building opportunity for us. And goodness knows we could use some of those. So, Sean, thank you. Thank you Chris, thank you very much. Thanks. Best of luck as you build your businesses. And again, thank you for your service, and may it continue for years to come. And to the audience, thank you very much. I think we're done. We're just at three zeros. Perfect. So thank you all very much, and I hope the rest of the day goes well for you all.